So we uh, dive in here? Yeah, let's get started. And what I've learned from last time <laughs> is to, even if we did do some preamble before we started recording, pretend as though we're just all coming into existence now. So <laughs> it's not strange. So <laughs> I'll, I'll let you introduce, uh, or I can, we could flip it. It's up to you. No, no, I'm, I'm happy to start. So I, I think uh, one of the things we heard from some of you is you were interested in hearing more about Zio Prelude. So uh, I think we're definitely gonna be coming back to doing more front end stuff, uh, leveraging some of Kit's skills and knowledge and passion, but we, uh, we wanna mix it up and not just do that. So uh, we thought this would be a good opportunity to explore Zio Prelude a little bit. Uh, and so I'll, I'll be trying to take us through that. And I'm going to focus a little bit on uh, first what it is, and then um, kind of how you can take it and bring it into a project that you're doing or at your company, at your organization, and kind of add value to it um, in a way that's that's incremental, where your coworkers and the rest of folks who are with you are going to feel like, oh, this is nice, versus like, oh my God, all this stuff is getting thrown at me. Um, and so we're definitely going to hit uh, eventually on kind of some of the like type classes and abstractions and stuff, but I'm actually going to try to tell you that's not necessarily the most important thing. So uh, Kit, make sure you have your like Gandalf staff ready there and are ready to be like, you shall not pass and like cast me out to protect the sanctity of symposium. Uh, absolutely. So I think the first question people have about Zio Prelude is just like, what is it? What's the deal with the name of most Zio libraries are pretty good about like Zio Kafka, like it's Zio with Kafka. There's like no surprise, you know exactly what it does. And Zio Prelude is kind of like, okay, what does that, what does that mean? Like, okay, I know kind of Prelude is like the beginning of something, but like, how does that apply to software and Zio? And so the, the way I like to think about it is um, it's a little bit like in, uh, in Scala, there, there's what's called uh, pre-def um, or in like, I think in, in Haskell, it actually is prelude. Um, but it's like, it's a set of basic things that are available to you for whatever application you're writing and are kind of generally useful. They're not themselves gonna change the world, but they're just generally useful for a lot of things you, you do. And so to, to see this, there, there's actually a setting that we can do. Um, so we can do this Galaxy options. And let me see if I can get this uh, SVC syntax right. And I believe it's why no imports. What does why no imports do? Yes, no imports. It takes away all the default imports that are in scope, but I'm feeling like I slightly messed up the compiler options here. So dash, uh, Vigo says dash Y. We dash need a dash before the Y. Thank you, Vigo. Yeah. Okay. And there we go. And so you see now I got like compilation errors because I have no list in scope. Scala doesn't know what a list is and Scala doesn't know what a left is here. Um, and so here, let me just change this to be Scala app instead of Zio app. So we don't have that one. But so we can see if I don't have that, this left thing doesn't work anymore because like left is in scope. There is no left right now because I took that away by doing that why no imports thing. And I think like either is kind of a good example of the types of things that you should expect from Zio Prelude in a way of like, either is probably not the solution to any like business problem you have. Like there's no problem that's gonna get solved just by having either. But it's also a pretty generically useful thing. Uh, it's useful for errors. And a lot of times we'll use, um, like if we have some numeric computation, we might say um, either, either string int, where string is some like error message if we have a like division by zero or something and int is like the result of the computation or sometimes it's useful just when we have two possibilities when we're merging a stream of a's and b's and we want to put them together into each stream element can either be an a or a b so it's just kind of a generally useful tool for us that we can probably use for a lot of different problems and isn't going to solve the problem itself but it's going to be one of the building blocks that's kind of going to help us solve the problem 
And just to cl clarify a couple of things, there's one question in the chat, which is that um, Phil asks, so the Scala C option is to disable the pre-death import automatically. And yeah, right, that's that's kind of what that- Yeah, that's so, so very technically, I think there are actually two different imports going on. There's a pre-death import and there's a Scala package object import. And so there are actually two different Scala C options to remove those. So there's like why no imports, which removes them both. And then there's why no pre-def, which only removes the pre-def. Um, but conceptually kind of, yeah, the same thing. And, and then the second question slash clarification is uh, the point of Zio Prelude is not to re-implement either and left, right? This is just no, an example. No, it, it, it's to do other tools that are generically useful like those. Um, and, and so we're gonna go through what some of those are. Um, but I, I just thought that was kind of maybe like a good example of the type of thing that, you no, know, there's no need to re-implement either because it already does what it does. It's great at what it does, but there are some other things that can be generally useful that didn't make it into the Scala library for whatever reason. In some cases, there's maybe they should have been there and they didn't. In some cases, they kind of require maybe being opinionated about things to a degree that Martin Oderski didn't feel like made sense for the Scala standard library, but that can be generally useful, especially when programming in a functional style. I've also heard certain people say that the standard libraries where things go to die and APIs go to, <laughs> to rot, I believe. That's very true, very true. Um, so in that vein, um, the first thing that I'd actually uh, like to kind of point us to is something called validation. And so a validation is something that can be used for handling errors where we want to accumulate more than one error. And it, I think it comes up pretty frequently in uh, like applications at big companies I've seen because you pretty frequently either have some type of data that's coming in that you need to validate or at some point you're kind of transforming one piece of data into another piece of data. And a lot of times you can get uh, multiple failures there and you want to accumulate those failures versus failing on the first one. Um, so maybe a simple example we could have and we can see the difference between either and validation here is if we have something like, um, let's say we're going to validate a user. And so we're gonna validate a user based on a name, that's a string and a age that's gonna be an integer. And if all we had was a Scala standard library, then maybe we would uh, return here like a either string or a user where this string here is gonna represent like what was wrong with this user if it's not valid. If they gave us an age of minus one or if they gave us a string that's a hundred thousand characters. And if we're implementing this in kind of a compositional way we might implement it with two other functions. So we'd say validate name is gonna take a name and that's either gonna fail with a string or give us back a name that we say is valid. And then we'll say validate age and that'll have an age it's an integer and that'll either fail with a message or that will give us a integer that we know is valid. That's the subset of numbers, that let's say is like greater than zero or less than hundred. And then we put those together here. We could use like a for comprehension and we could say name and validate name. And I'm just gonna rename this. So it's like a little bit more clear. Let's call it validated name. And then we'll say validated age invalidate age, age, and then we can yield a user with the validated name and the validated age. And let's just give ourselves some like simple implementation here. We'll just say like if name dot link less than, let's just say 20, then we'll give ourselves right name and otherwise we'll say left 
name was too long. And then we can do something similar here. If we could say uh, if age is less than zero or age is greater than 100, then we'll turn a left and we'll just say age out of reasonable bounds. And otherwise, we'll return a right with the age. And let's see if, oh, and of course, I should actually define <laughs> a data type for my user here. Okay. And let's see. Go. And so now I could do something like uh, val validated user is equal to validate user Bob. And then I'm going to make a mistake here and make this minus one. And then we could cut this out so we can see this. Oops, and oh, do I have my, oh yeah, let me undo. This is why it's annoying to do it with the <laughs> no imports because you don't have any <laughs> basic things. <laughs> so instead I'm gonna reload this and then let's try to compile this and run it. Yeah, you'd have to manually say like import scala.predef, right? Everyone. Yeah, it, it, exactly, and scala.all, yeah. Um, so you can see this works fine when we just have like one error. But a little bit of the problem with this is that the either has these fail fast semantics, which are good in a lot of cases, but are, are not great in this case, which means that as soon as one of these things fails, we're just going to stop doing more work. And we're just going to return that failure. And so here, let's, uh, let's, let's add a little condition here. Let's say uh, if name dot length is greater than zero and less than 20. Um, and we'll just generalize this and say uh, invalid name. And then change uh, Bob to empty string. Oh, gosh. And so now if I run this, I get this error message left invalid name, which is, is totally true, but it is, is incomplete in a way of like, that's actually not the only problem with this user here. There are two problems, right? The name is not there and the age is wrong. And so we can imagine a bunch of situations where it could just be that we're internally within our application translating between two different data types. And like, we're gonna write this to our log somewhere. And, if this, if we just write this into our logs, this is probably not the greatest thing because, like, we actually haven't written the logs everything that goes wrong. And if someone goes to try to fix this, like, as soon as they fix this thing, it's just going to fail for some other reason. Uh, or you can also imagine, like, if you have some kind of uh, user-facing application, like what we were working on uh, the last couple of weeks, where you're getting some input from the user and you're asking them to put in all these things, and they do. And then you like give them an error message and you say, okay, your name was, you put in your name and they put in their name. And then like, okay, now you give them back another error message and you say, ah, oh, and also your age is wrong. Like that's a little bit annoying versus like what you'd like to be your user experience is like, you kind of try to submit it and you get a bunch of like all the fields get highlighted in red that are wrong. And all of them have like nice little messages of like, you didn't fill this out at all. Or like this wasn't within the bounds or whatever. And then the user can kind of do all of those and correct them at once. So this ends up being a pretty common situation and Zio Prelude gives us a nice data type to deal with this called validation. And a validation has two type parameters, just like either. And the only difference is that instead of composing with this for comprehension thing and failing on the first one, it lets us uh, accumulate all the errors that we have. So if we take the same thing, we can refactor this to use this validation data type. And so I'm just gonna change the return types there. 
I'm going to change these to be validation.success and validation.failure. So you can think of success as like the way we traditionally use the right side of an either and failure being like the way we normally use the left side. And let's, oh, uh, hold on. Sorry, I'm going to use the left instructors here. There we go. And then the other thing I want to do here is instead of using flat map, I'm going to do this validation dot validate with operator. And so this just lets me combine more than one validation value with a function. So I'm going to do validate dot validate with, and I'll just say validate name, name, validate age, age. And then I just get a function here that has a name and an age. And I'll just do user of name age. And so now things are otherwise the same, but now I've got this validated user that's a validation of a string or a user. And now if I run this, I get this chunk. So this is just like a Zio data type. It's kind of like a list or a vector. It's just kind of Zio's like efficient general purpose data type. And it's got both of those errors. So I think, again, like it's a little bit similar to the either that like it's not doing anything magical or amazing for us, but it's doing something that's pretty useful for this problem. And I, I think it's a problem that comes up a good amount in your day-to-day -day code. And it's also something that is pretty easy to introduce here of, right? I haven't brought in any fancy type classes. I haven't brought in any abstractions. I've just brought in this one data type that is pretty straightforward, pretty easy to explain and takes care of this problem pretty well. Um, so that that's kind of first thing I would say is like, here's like a good thing to use the prelude for. Any, uh, any questions on that before we so, so, uh, well, we might get into this. Um, so someone asked, um, uh, if, uh, validated dot validate with is essentially applicative, uh, mm -hmm. obviously we we might get into, uh, yeah. Oh, well, that's the question. <laughs> yeah. So that, that, that's a hundred percent, right. That this validate with another way I could describe this is this is like the Zio is the equivalent of like for each, um, which if we want to be, if we want to kind of go into kind of classic category terms is a traversable functor and a replicative functor and doing all that and the essence of the iterator pattern and all of those things. And, and that's a hundred percent right. Um, and I think that also we'll, we'll come back to this a little bit more. And I mean, we definitely will get to the uh, abstractions, but one of the goals here, and I think with one of the distinguishing features of Zio overall is that you, um, you can use the abstractions, but you don't have to use the abstractions. Um, so one of the things that I don't think we've uh, hit on yet is there's a big difference between Zio Prelude and the way it interacts with the Zio ecosystem versus other ecosystems where in most other ecosystems, you would have Zio Prelude being at the top. And then like Zio would depend on Zio Prelude. And so when you were working with Zio, you would, you, you would be dealing with all of these different types from Zio Prelude and our versions of you know, associative and identity and for each and all of these different abstractions. And we kind of take the opposite approach of Zio Prelude depends on Zio, but as a Zio user, you never have to use Zio Prelude. I, I'm, I'm gonna go through these different features and I think there are some nice things that can be useful for you, but you'll, you never have, you never will have to use Zio Prelude or any of these abstractions to use Zio. And I, I think that creates a nice experience where you can kind of explore these different levels of abstraction as it makes sense for you instead of kind of being forced to where like you're just trying to do the equivalent of like, for each on Zio and like suddenly someone's like, 
ah, oh, like you don't have an instance of traversable and you're like, hey, what's traversable? And you kind of have to like go into all this research. And I, I, you know, some people will say like, oh, that makes you like intellectual or you think people are stupid. I don't think it's that at all. I, I think it's that people are smart, but people are thinking about their own problems. They're doing machine learning or natural language processing or infrastructure or whatever. And like, they wanna be able to think about those problems and they shouldn't have to think about like these other things to be able to use our library. We should just like solve the specific problems we're trying to solve. Um, but yes, like we're, there's definitely like more structure behind this and we'll, we'll get to that. Awesome. Uh, Little soapbox. Fire emoji, I, I say to you. Um, and also I, uh, a follow-up question, which is slightly unrelated is um, at least to the, the type class stuff is, is uh, will it provide refined types? I don't know if you wanna to get to that at the end or maybe a simple. <laughs> so that is actually a perfect uh, segue for uh, my next kind of, uh, I'll call it quick win with Zio Prelude, um, which is the support for new types and smart types. So another super, super common thing, I think in like, especially in like large organizations that part of the reason they're using SCAL is like they want more correctness, they want more type safety, is to try to get away from just having these like strings and ints sitting out there and to kind of have a more strongly typed domain model. Um, and you see people doing a couple of solutions when they uh, don't have like the tools to do it that none of them are entirely great. So one thing I've definitely seen sometime, it sometimes is a pattern like this where you would do type name equals string, type age equals int, and then here you would do like name is name, age is age. Oh, this already makes me sad. <laughs> um, and th th this is a, a super common thing. Like I've, I've seen this at lar lots of large organizations. Um, and like in a way it's, it's like, it's trying to go in the right direction of like, and at least it kind of gives you like, a visual clue of like, okay, this name is supposed to be a name, this age is supposed to be an age. But the problem is that like from the Scala compiler's perspective, a name and an age are exactly the same thing. And so there's nothing that's like stopping you from putting a name that's empty or a name that's long or an age that's negative in here. It's just kind of, it's like just for you in a little, in a way. And I think sometimes it can actually have a little bit of a negative effect because I mean, one, you may just, you may think you have more type safety than you do, but two, it can kind of obfuscate things a little bit where like, okay, here it's like super obvious, but if I'm in some giant project and like these are all in like a completely separate module, like it can, it can just make it like harder sometimes for like me to know what types I'm actually dealing with without actually giving me the type safety. So, so that's kind of one thing I see. Uh, so then sometimes people will say, okay, got it. That, that was not so good. So then the next place you can go is something like, so now you've like created your own case class for these. And maybe what people will do from here is they'll try to create smart constructors for these. Um, so we could even, do that here, but just to kind of explore this a little bit. So now we're gonna say, say, okay, so name, the name we take in is just gonna be a string. And then we wanna return the actual name here. So now we'll pack the name inside of here. And similarly here, we're just gonna take in an integer. And then if it's within the range, we're going to turn age here. And then this is also gonna take in the raw string and the int. And now all of this will be happy here. And right now I don't have a ton more type safety cause I can kind of just like, I can do you know, age minus 23 and this will compile, but if I want to, I can kind of try to give myself a little bit more protection here of I can like try to make this private and I can make some kind of smart constructor. 
but it can kind of get like a little bit boilerplate here because then we say, okay, now I need to like return either an option or a validation and I kind of need to pass that around. And there's also some runtime cost to this because I'm now putting these things in all these additional objects here. So what CO Prelude provides to help with this is this new type functionality. That's pretty nice. So what we can do there is at the very top here, I've imported this zo.prelude.newtypes uh, um, as well as just zo prelude itself. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna define an object that has the type I wanna create. So it's like, we'll do name first. So we'll say object name extends and then right now I'm going to extend subtype uh, and I'll, I'll explain what that is a sec. And I'm going to parameterize that on the actual type that I know it is. So I'm going to say object name extends subtype string. And then I'm going to say type name equals name dot type. And th this is just a little bit of like, this is the way you, you do it within your prelude to construct these things. Um, but there are a couple of things that are uh, kind of cool about this. And I'm just, I'm gonna comment this out for a sec while we play with this, just to kind of explore some things before we push this all the way through. The first thing that's neat is that a name is a different type than a string. Uh, so, and I can actually prove that. I can say implicitly is string a subtype of name. And then Provost says, nope, it is not. Those are two different types. So I'm not gonna be able to use a string somewhere that I need a name. And we can even just do, let's say, process name, name. Maybe I'm just gonna make this unit you know, just because we're gonna play with this. And so if I say process name Adam, it's gonna say, nope, that doesn't work. You needed a name and you just gave me a string. So it sees these as different types. It's gonna give me that protection there, but it's also easy for me to put a value inside this. So if I wanna put a value inside here, I can say, and now this will work. And this new type here is being created with no runtime overhead. So this is entirely at compile time. The Scala compiler sees this as two different types, but they're actually completely the same type. And the other thing that is really neat about this is I can either use subtype or new type here. And so new type means if I do new type here, then that's saying that name and string are completely unrelated types. They're like apples and oranges. The Scala compiler doesn't know anything about them. But a lot of times that's nice to instead say that this name is gonna be a subtype of a string. And the cool thing about that is it means that I can use any methods on strings. So like I could have a method called name length that takes a name and it's just gonna do name dot length. And so here, name is a different type than string, but just because of what this machinery here is doing for me, I get to call all the methods that I'm already calling on a string on a name. So it, it's, it's really nice sometimes for cutting down the boilerplate on defining these new types, because otherwise if you, if you use like this pattern up here, you can spend a lot of time when you're actually working with it, kind of unpacking it to use a method on it and then repacking it or having to like re-implement a bunch of functionality on this. Um, so this ends up being really nice. Uh, and the other thing you can do is there's even a variant here uh, called subtype smart. And this one, uh, essentially, it gives you a smart constructor for free. And so 
So now this is going to automatically validate any instances that I create of this thing. Um, and so now I use a slightly different syntax here. I say name.makeAdam. And now this is going to give me one of those validation values. So we're also starting to see how like the different pieces fit together. Uh, you can imagine I can define a new type for the name, a new type for the age, and each of those is going to have a built-in way to validate it. And each of those is going to give me back a validation value. And then I can put those together just like we saw here. So I think that's another like really nice thing that I think in large code bases, like I, I, I think you see so many examples of this like defining either type aliases or different types to kind of try to like create that additional type safety. And this is a really nice way to both uh, eliminate any performance overhead associated with that as well as do it in a pretty ergonomic way in a way that actually gives you that type safety. Um, so I think that's another kind of quick win you can bring into um, an organization as you're starting to uh, use this stuff. Uh, a couple of questions. Um, so someone was uh, curious about whether or not this is using uh, macros. And, I, th and yeah. I think it does relate to sort of like the refined type stuff. Um, yeah, so, so this actually doesn't use macros at all. Um, it uses abstract type members and it basically just works within Scala's type system to kind of hide one part of Scala from knowing that these two things are actually the same, but letting it know at another place. Uh, so there are no macros involved in this, which is, which is one of the interesting things about it. And it, it works completely on uh, Scala 2 as well as uh, Scala 3 right now. Um, I think we are going to have some macro power functionality coming that's going to um, take even more of this to compile time if you want to. Uh, so like right now, you see if you do this like name.make thing here, you're getting this validation value. So you're getting this like runtime value that said, okay, at runtime, we looked at this and we decided, we determined it was either a valid name or it wasn't. Uh, I think one of the things we have coming is some functionality that's going to be able to look at this at compile time and say, oh, Adam's a valid name, so this is fine. This is just going to return a name. And if I had tried to do like this, actually give me a compilation error for that. That's going to be macro powered and that's coming in the future. But right now, everything's actually um, pure Scala, no, no macros. Cool. Um, so, oh, yeah. So, a couple more questions. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, someone's happy, no macro amazing. Uh, and, and then someone is asking, uh, is this assertion, is this using assertions from Zio test? Uh, if this is using assertions from Zio test, uh, should we put them into, um, another project like Zio assertions or something, or else it might pop up regularly in code reviews with a comment? Yeah, it, 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 there, there, there is an open issue about this and it's something that we're, uh, we're exploring. Cause I, I think particularly for some build systems, um, they kind of have a, a pretty, they expect a pretty strong separation between um, kind of test versus non-test dependencies. So I think at some point probably we'll just, I think probably the easiest way to do it is just gonna be to make um, Zio Prelude have its own set of assertions, at least for the common things. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think that's uh, something that's uh, probably coming down the pike. Awesome. And let's see, I hope you're recording this. Yes, it is definitely. Uh, yes, <laughs> I'll definitely need to go through this another time to fully get this. Yeah, this can be a little, a little tricky for sure, but it is being recorded. So watch it in slow motion a hundred times. Uh, <laughs> and then also uh, there was a question about, um, uh, even though they may have rescinded their question, but I'll ask it anyway. Yeah. Which is, <laughs> um, I guess in generally, what are your thoughts about sort of um, what is it? What is the recommended approach to? What is the? I'll just verbatim. What is the recommended approach to importing Prelude versus manually importing stuff when you program a library? Um, something that is supposed to be used by others. Do we have a guideline here? I'm thinking about C++. If I'm just putting stuff together, I'll say using namespace std. But for larger programs, I wouldn't 
use it to keep everything clean and in separate namespaces. So I, I'm, I'm not familiar with C++, but I'm wondering if maybe the questions around like importing dot underscore versus sort of separating things into packages and just importing things. I think like Zio definitely has its preferences and is probably less separated out than other libraries. But do you have any sort of thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think it probably somewhat depends on um, team norms as well as just how much content from something you're using. So especially at the beginning, if, if the only thing from Zio Prelude that you're using is validation and you're using it just in a very concrete way like we were showing here, then I think probably import zio.prelude.validation makes a ton of sense. I think uh, if you're going all in and using this, use the new types, we're gonna start to go a little bit deeper into some of the abstractions. Um, I think then you get to a point where you probably just want to bring in the whole thing because then you get like a lot of extension methods and implicits and you kind of make sure everything works. So I think it kind of depends where you are on that continuum as well as probably a little bit of just uh, team norms. Like I mean, most time when I'm working with Zio, like import Zio.all is like a pretty standard import for me, but different people can have different preferences there. I know this question was then there's another question which was answered in the chat, but just for uh, the people who watch it um, in the recording for their benefits. Uh, a question was, can you have multiple assertions, right? So you have has size string is greater than zero. Mm -hmm. uh, With a little friendly operator called uh, and, yeah, you could say has size uh, string. Uh, is... You could even put that inside of the has size string then if, if, uh, if they're both sort of predicates of oh, that. Yeah. Uh, that, that, that's true as well. Yeah. Yeah. So you can do, you can do lots of things with these and you can uh, put them together with this. You could even extract this into its own value and you could use it with multiple different subtypes you were creating. So there's a lot of flexibility with these. That's awesome. I'm thinking because someone did bring up sort of a refined library. That might be a fun topic for some future because I know we wanted to get into macros eventually. It might be fun to sort of like see I wonder if there's a way to have both this sort of runtime validation, but at the same time, a, a sort of accrete compile time constraints as well. So you could use these same constructors. Uh, yeah, well, that, that's essentially what, what Jorge is doing with his work on Zio Prelude that, that he went through at, at Zio World. So um, I think there's a talk on that that's out or coming out. Um, but I think when he's uh, ready to talk more about that, maybe he could be a fun guest to have for another installment and uh, yeah, we could we could talk about that and macros and, and all that stuff. That's awesome. I think we got through the question queue. Oh wait, one last down. Could this slow down Scala compilation when used a lot, like when using implicits the wrong way? Uh, I, I have never seen a appreciable impact on compilation from this. I think one of the advantages of it from that perspective is it's very local. Um, so like the kind of computation of this like value all just occurs within this one smart type thing. I think where like you can really have the impact on compilation with implicits is where you have kind of implicitly derived implicits deriving from others, deriving from others, and it's some huge project and kind of it creates this like global scope where you're like looking in all these different places for things versus with this, there's essentially only one place to look for it and it's right in here. Mm -hmm. and, and we got one more question while answering the other questions, which is, so uh, Zio Prelude subtype and new type have several uh, advantages over opaque types, um, like validations, any other diffs, question mark. So are there, uh, I guess uh, I may have read that incorrectly, but are there, are there uh, advantages over opaque types like validations? I'm not sure if I, I might need some further clarification, but. Um, yeah, so, so Scala 3 brings uh, support for the, this concept of opaque types. And I think it's it's been evolving a little bit even over kind of the different releases exactly what's kind of um, involved uh, with that. Um, I think one advantage of this is just it's available on a cross version basis of, I think for the foreseeable future, any of us who are writing code for you know, not our own little toy project essentially need to support both Scala 2 and Scala 3. And so it's, it, it's in a way a not great situation where it's like hard to take advantage of those Scala 3 features. Um, and so one of the nice things about this is you can get this and you can just write it and it'll work on Scala 3, it'll work on Scala 2, it'll work on 2.11, 2.12, 2.13. 
Um, and uh, when we'll, we'll come back to it in, in a little while when we talk more about some of the abstractions, but it also has some nice functionality where you can define type class instances for these things and have them available within implicit scope. Awesome. So yeah, I think uh, got through the queue. All right, cool. Um, so I think I'm going to put this to the side for a little while and hit on. So we, we've talked about validation as being one quick win, these new types and subtypes as being another quick win. Uh, the, the other one I, I want to hit on now, and I mean, there are definitely others, but you know, I'm <laughs> we only have so much time with you here, uh, is ways to combine data types. And that's also going to lead us a little bit into uh, more of the traditional abstractions and Zio Prelude's take on those and more soapboxing on those. Um, so to motivate us here, I, I was actually thinking a little bit about the application that we were working on the last couple of weeks. And so I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, but I think we had something like this vote state thing. Um, and I think this was basically had underlying it, this map, I think was basically like a map from strings to ints where like the string would be like the thing you're voting for. So maybe the questions about like, what's your favorite HTTP solution? And you know, these strings would be like Zio HTTP, Uzi HTTP, whatever. And the int would be like count of like how many people voted for that thing. Um, and so we could imagine, I think in that application, all we did was we had like one vote state and we just kept adding votes to it. But we could imagine we had like two of these vote states and we wanted to combine them together into another vote state. And so we could definitely do that without like any machinery from Zio Prelude. And so we could do something like we could define this combined method that's gonna take another vote state. And it's going to give us a vote state back. And so here we're going to do something like self.map. And then we're going to fold left onto that.map. And so this is going to give us a map and then a nested topic and votes. We want to do something with that. And then we could say something like we want to do map.get topic and match on that. And we could say we either get some and we've already got some votes in there. And then we want to do something. We don't have any votes. And then we want to do something. And let's see that one, this whole thing. I need to wrap back up in a vote state. And then we could say, all right, here, I already had some current votes. So I'm going to return the map plus the topic to, and then the previous votes plus the new votes. And then if I didn't have anything. I'm just going to add this to the map. Let's see if I got, okay. So that's compiling. And then we could just make a little example for ourselves. So we could say that left votes equals vote state map, say zero HTTP to four and Uzi HTTP only gets two because this author consistently tells people they should not use it. Um, and then this is going to be a vote state. CO HTTP got another two votes and TOS HTTP got three votes. And so we'd then like to be able to do left votes, combine right votes. We'll call that val find votes. And we'll print that out just to see what we got here. And okay, so we kind of did what we wanted here, right? We added up the 
votes for ZOHCP and we got the ones that were in each of them. So this I think is probably reasonably reflective of like data manipulation type things that we might encounter um, and is probably a relatively simple example of that. And I think in like the, I think it's in like the Scala collections contrib library, there's like a variant of an operator that would like do this for us, I think like union with. Um, and it wasn't like, it wasn't in anything incredibly hard here, but you can also kind of imagine if you had like a coworker who was like just coming to Scala from Java or something and like want to do this, like all of this like fold left and pattern matching, like it's not the easiest thing in the world. So it would be kind of nice to have a way to clean this up. And I think this is like maybe like the practical or at least one of the practical entry points for um, some of the like uh, more traditional abstractions in Zio Prelude where, so let's try to implement another version of this that requires us to do less work with Zio Prelude. So we'll say this is combine Zio Prelude. It'll be vote state to vote state. And I'm gonna do vote state and starting point, I'm gonna do self.map. And then I'm gonna use this little arrow arrow, which is the um, operator in Zio Prelude for basically combine two things. Uh, so I'll do self.map, that.map. And what this is gonna do is it's essentially gonna do this logic for me, though I'm gonna need to give it one more bit of help in a second that I'll explain. And so this is gonna take all of the keys from the two maps, combine them together, and then when there are overlapping keys, it's gonna combine those values for the keys. And so the only thing it's missing here right now is knowing how to combine the values for the keys, because there are different ways you could wanna combine these integers. In this case, you wanna add them, but that's not necessarily always true. Sometimes we might wanna multiply them or we might have some more complicated operation that we can do with them. And the way we tell the compiler how we want to combine them in Zio Prelude is uh, actually using more of that new type functionality. And so there are an existing set of new types that we can just take advantage of for this. And so here, since we wanna add, we're just gonna use sum. And we're gonna call this wrap all thing, which is just gonna put this inside each of these values inside a sum. And it's not, this is completely compile time. This is not gonna traverse this collection at all. It's purely compile time. But I'm just going to wrap all of these guys. And now this compiles. Hey, that's awesome. <laughs> I didn't actually know. I just will comment that out. We'll change this to the same name. And boom. Exactly the same. That is very cool. I thought you were going to import some implicit stuff or uh, assign some implicits. That's that's really really cool. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think that's kind of again the nice thing of like, okay, we we've brought in a little bit more here, but I think like this is something where again you're kind of trying to get something into a new organization that's maybe not as comfortable with this, like. This is, I think, not that scary. I mean, you, you've got like nice reduction in kind of code and code complexity here. You had no changes to your method signature. This is, okay, you have a new operator here, but it doesn't, doesn't look crazy. Um, I think this is another one of these things that you can kind of sell as like a little bit of a quick win. Um, <laughs> so we've got uh, some good feedback. Um... Mm -hmm. It looks elegant, Dom Doran says, but from looking at it, I have no clue what's happening as compared to the fold code. So I think that's a, a fair. Yeah, what, what, are your, what are your thoughts? Well, so I, I think that's a perfect uh, segue to get into a little bit more of like what some of these different abstractions are and how they fit together. Um, let me just show one more thing before we go on here that can be kind of cool. Um, so 
we talked before about how the new type functionality played together with the uh, validation functionality. Uh, these also fit together um, with this uh, combining data types functionality. So right now we have this map from string to int that we could say, okay, that's maybe not the most type safe thing. So let's, let's use the same technique we saw before to try to improve that. So why don't we say object topic extends subtype string. We'll say type topic equals topic.type. And then we'll do object votes extends subtype int and type votes equals votes.type. And now we're going to change this vote state to be a map from topics to votes. So we're going to get a little more type safety there. And now obviously we're going to have a little bit of compilation issues, but let's just fix those one at a time. So we'll come back to this in a sec. Um, I'll just create a few values for these. So let's say val zero HTTP votes is equal to uh, so now all that's compiling. And then all what we can also do here is for votes here, we can define our own way to combine votes. So, and here we're gonna get a little bit into the type classes and we're gonna come back to this in a sec. So this is going to be a way to combine votes. And the way we're gonna combine votes is associative votes. So all we're gonna do is we're going to take the left and the right, we're gonna add them together and we're gonna package them up in votes. And so now we can actually simplify this even more because we don't even need to do this wrapping. What have I done? Okay, I guess it's lying to me saying I have 100 compilation errors and we got the exact same thing there. So now we've both gotten more type safety here where we've gotten away from having this like string to int map to having this be like very clear and strongly typed what this is. And we've gotten this like pretty much for free way of combining these together. Um, so I, I think from here we, we are going to go, at least depending on how much time people are willing to spend with me, <laughs> we will go into more of the abstractions, but uh, do people have any questions before we do that? Yeah, a couple. So um, I think you kind of showed off a way to solve this, which someone asked how you would write a custom data type like sum. You've basically done that, except it's uh, votes there. Um, and then there's the also asking, um, Don Dorn asked, can you show what sum.wrap all does, and that, that kind of comes with subtype, right? Yeah, so uh, we can definitely, let's uh, go back to that. The answer is it basically does nothing except for playing games with types. Um, so it just calls the subtype dot wrap all, um, which basically just takes these two types that within this context are known to be the same but outside of that context are not known to be the same and it just retypes them. Um, so that's kind of that idea of like, there's no runtime cost to this. Like all it is is using kind of abstract types and advanced features of Scala's type system to retain the information that these two types are the same in one place, but hide that in another part of your program. And some is something like the, the vote subtype here that has its own associative instance. So all, all you have to do is really just really just recast it with this nice helper method. And then 
you get for free, it then finds the right associated instance. Yeah, it's basically just a clue for the compiler almost on like just how to combine these things. And do you get int wrap all as well? Is that is that part of subtype or is that special on some? I'm oh, sorry, do you get votes dot wrap all? Is that does that come uh, is that part of the API of, of subtype? Uh, yeah. So anytime you define a, a new type or a subtype, you get this wrap all. Obviously, uh, you don't need that here because they're already the right. Right. There is one other question, which uh, Phil asks, where is zero in this example, right? So how does it know how to, uh, if you have an empty vote map, right, or, or something, how do you know to, uh, where's the identity? Where's the, the zero element? Maybe we're going to get to there. Maybe that's the next segment. Uh, well, so in, in this case, uh, and, and we, we can dive more into it, in this case, you actually, own, for this sum type or, or the votes type, you only need an associative instance because the uh, zero is just you're not going to have an entry forward in the map because um, all we're going to the only time we need to kind of do something with these two values is when we're adding them together. Um, otherwise, we're just going to take them and just take whatever we've got. So we actually only need what we call an associative instance here. Um, but that's a perfect segue uh, to talk more about these abstractions. Um, do we want to do a little bit of poll on how people are feeling on time? We can definitely, I'm happy to go uh, longer. I don't, I don't know if, uh, how people are feeling. I, I think we should, I mean, I'm, I'm interested. I want to get deeper. I think uh, it'll be recorded. So if people need to drop off, I think I'll, I'll definitely try to edit out all the, you know, tighten it up as much as possible. Yeah, uh, yeah. They can, they can, but I think it would be interesting to sort of, yeah, dive a little bit further and and get up yeah. on, the, oh, I'm gonna hear you on the soapbox, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think where, where we left is we've seen it's like, it's pretty cool to be able to just combine things this way, but it does kind of express of like, well, what's going on here? We, we can kind of see it's doing like the right thing at the end, but like, how did we get there? And so this is where we do get to a little bit more of the abstractions. Um, and so, all of these are really uh, based on the idea of some kind of type class. And I'm, I'm just going to start with this associative one because it's a really uh, simple one. And so this associative trait is just parameterized on one type. And it's just defined in terms of this one method that says, given two values of type A, here's how to combine them into a new value of type A. And that's at the top of really, I think what you could think of as like one of the three hierarchies of types of abstractions within Zio Prelude. Um, and, and so if I try to break that down, I think you could say hierarchy number one is ways of combining concrete values. And so within this, there are ways of combining them that are associative. And we can come back to a second what that means. There are ways of combining them that have an identity operation. And there are ways of combining them that can be commutative. Then let's say hierarchy number two, I would call it, um, it's almost ways of consuming concrete values. And so here you would have equal hash and ordering. So these are all ways of saying, given one or more values of a type, I know how to do something with them. I know how to compare them to each other. I know how to turn them into integer hashes. I know how to say whether they're equal to each other. Um, and then Hierarchy number three, I would say uh, ways of combining parameterized types. So if this is um, a A to A, this one is F of A and F of A. To F of A. 
and you actually have similar ones to what you did before where this can be associative and this can have an identity operation and this can be commutative. And so what these do is they give you a way to describe how to, in these two cases, combine values and these two ways, how to like say whether they're equal in a way that is composable um, and principled. So if we think about like this associative instance as an example, we can imagine some instances of this that are really simple. Um, so one we saw before uh, would just be addition. So we can combine two integers to get another integer by adding them up. Um, but where this gets interesting is some of them can depend on other instances. So like this one was super obvious, but what happens if we want to say, uh, how do we combine two maps? Um, and I'll parameterize this on a key and value. And so I'm going to get associated there for this key and value. Oh, I think you need to wrap it in map. Oh, and uh, an equals up above. Oh yeah, I'm creating problems for myself left and right. <laughs> Left and right. <laughs> that was a bad, not intentional joke. <laughs> um, and so here's where we really see the answer to that question and actually where, so we can't, uh, oh, I guess I, uh, I think I deleted that, so I'll have to redo a little bit. But so here's where we have to do that work that we, we managed to get rid of it ourselves, but we basically pushed it into the library here. So if I want to combine these two maps, I could say right dot fold left left. And then this is going to give me the map, the key and the value. And I can do a similar thing if I can say map dot get key. And I guess I did case like that. And this is basically the. It, it, it's exactly basically the logic that I wrote above, except I, I should have been better and not deleted that, but I didn't do that. I will instead re implement it. <laughs> so I can either get there's a value there before, or I can find there was no value there before. And so if there's no value there before, then it's easy. I'm just going to add the key and the value to the map. And if the value was there before, then I clearly want to keep the key in the map. But now I need some way, I've got a V and I've got a V2. And I need some way of combining them, which I don't really have right now, but I can add that as a constraint for myself. So I can say I have to have a way to combine those V values. And then in here, I can just call associative.combine VV2. And it's not necessarily, let's see, am I off by a, hmm, off by a bracket? Oh, uh, oh, because I'm, I'm now completely confusing it with my, uh, <laughs> the new associative instance I'm making up versus the one from Zio Prelude. So I'm going to take this, just to comment this out for a minute here. But so here, now I've got a way to combine two maps. And it's not necessarily completely obvious just from looking at the code here, but in fact, we can prove that if this instance here is actually an associative operation, which Sorry, I didn't define that earlier. That basically means that if I have A1, A2, and then I do A3, 
that's the same as doing A1 and then A2 and A3. So the order of the parentheses doesn't matter. And that ends up being a pretty useful property that applies to a lot of different uh, things. Um, and so here now I've got like a really principled way to take that manual logic that we implemented at like the very beginning for uh, combining these votes and now generalize it where like now I could say I, I could do that not only for like adding the votes, but if instead I like wanted to like multiply the votes, I could, that would also be a thing I could do. And I could have just with actual Zeo prelude, I could have done that like product dot wrap all instead of some dot wrap all. And then that would have happened. Um, but so that's a little bit of like what's happening under the hood with these different type classes and why like when you saw that like arrow arrow that wasn't like some magic thing it, it's just actually taking some pretty basic things here of like addition and like map combination and just putting them together in a logical way it's it's kind of the mechanical process that you would just undertake doing normal refactoring and say like okay where's the difference it's here in this combination before yeah this looked exactly the same except you manually did plus v plus v2 but now you've just taken that v plus v2 and moved it into some ugly i mean confusingly named perhaps abstract uh thing called an associative but the the plus uh v1 plus v2 is now just on line 17 it's you know when you get this abstract, you kind of have to come up with weird names, but it's you would you you could naturally progress to this in your own code base. It's just sort of maybe abstract. yeah, I mean, that, that that that's a hundred percent true. I mean, so yeah, and I mean, let's even let's like play with that a little bit. I mean, we could say um, this is like uh, combined maps, and we could say we need a implicit value combiner. Uh, And we could, um, this might not even return a type class. Maybe this is just the combined maps here. So, I mean, we, we could make this a lot more concrete, but it turns out that by making it a little more abstract, we give ourselves more power where like, let's say I don't have a map of ints, but I have a map of map of ints. So that's something that like, I mean, boy, like if this was annoying, can you imagine kind of going through that and like every one of these, like, do this whole thing all over again to like combine those nested maps versus with this thing with like Zia Prelude, that's just can be automatic of if I have a map of map of ints and I know I want to add those ints, I can still combine all of those and that'll just work for me. And that's kind of like the, the essence of composition, right? You've solved, you've just solved the problem of combining two maps very generally. And now it can be plugged in with other solutions to other problems, which may, maybe with it own, its own self for nested maps or with uh, ints or Booleans or anything else. And yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of cool. <laughs> yeah. um, so a, a couple of other things I'd like to hit on with the type classes um, and, and maybe just highlight some of the differences between our approach to them and some of the other approaches you might've seen. So the, the first here is you, you can see we, we really tried to go back to, uh, you could say kind of the, the first principles here and what each of these things are. So like in other, um, actually, even if we go to Zio Prelude, let me, I'm just gonna comment some of this stuff out so we can actually get the Zio Prelude version. Um, but let's go to Prelude. And let me know when you're uh, good for a, a garbage collection pause because we've got some questions. I shouldn't oh, call yeah. why don't we do, why don't we do that? that? That's perfect. I shouldn't call them garbage. They're great questions. Um, all right, so let's see. Uh, well, first of all, at least a couple of people are willing to stay as long as you're willing to talk um, or until they run out of beer. Uh, so <laughs> the advantage of doing an evening in, in Europe, right? <laughs> or or uh, maybe getting started early on <laughs> afternoon in the West Coast. <laughs> exactly. Um, I'll kind of, I'll work from the, the, the back. So there was, um, or from the, the bottom, the most recent. What was the reason for not calling associative semi-groups? So, Maybe. Yeah, so that, 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 that's a great question. That was actually what I was going to a little bit is, so yeah, so um, there's actually a classic 
um, there's actually a set of like classic, uh, let me see if I can import zero.classic, let's see, where am I, there we go. So yeah, so there is a, there are classic names for a lot of these things. Instead of associative, you could call it semi-group and instead of identity, you could call it monoid and you have all these different things. Uh, there were, I think really two reasons we didn't. So one was educational that if I say something's a semi-group, that basically conveys no information to you unless you know what a semi-group is, which like basically if you know what a semi-group is, you like, you know the whole game. Like you've already like, you already know this stuff. So I'm not telling you anything. Um, versus if I tell you something's associative, I mean, maybe you don't know what associative is, but like, that's a pretty straightforward concept I could explain to you. And I think there's a pretty decent chance that like, you know, I mean, we may have all forgotten it, but like you probably learned that at some point in I don't know, high school or college math or something. Like, I think you've got a better chance of knowing what associative than what a semi-group is. Um, if you're not already kind of a pretty deep into this stuff. Um, so that's kind of the first reason. The second reason is that each of these properties here are orthogonal to each other. So you could have different combinations of them. You could have something that has associative and identity. You could have something that has all three of these. Um, and you can have something that has different combinations of these properties. And so if you define them separately and you just define them as what they are, then uh, it's very easy to define combinations of them in a compositional way. Uh, versus if all of these things are their own, like very specific names, then you end up just having a lot of names. So like, if you look here, like even within this like basic hierarchy of, so like our things are associative, commutative, identity, and then we have one thing that has inverse. So like four different items here. But if you look at like the classic items those map to, there are six different items. So what we've done here is we've identified commonalities of these that can compose together to create these different ones by mixing them in and by taking advantage of Scala's type system. Um, and you see, we, we start to get even more here. And as we get into some of these like fancier ones, there are like, if you go to some of these libraries, like it starts out as like, okay, functor, monad, traversable, like, okay, fine. But like you go to the actual library and there are like 80 different type classes and you're kind of like, hold on here. Like, where's the abstraction? Like I thought we were like understanding like fundamental truths here. And now we got like 80 things, like what's, what's going on? Um, so we feel like this gives a more fundamental uh, approach on going of what's going on by looking at these individual things that are actually separate from each other and can combine in different ways versus just combining them together to begin with. Awesome. Yeah, I think that that makes a, a lot of sense. And if you just that the package diagram or, or type alias thing was pretty great because yes, semi groupal and, and whatnot, you just you have to learn a lot more concepts and right. what, what are these things like if, if I tell you, hey, there's a thing that has associative with identity with commutative, like even if you don't like think about those three things separately, like if you know what those three things are, you can think about exactly what I'm telling you about that thing. Versus if I tell you it's semi-groupal again, like again, unless you already know, like I haven't actually told you anything. Sure. Um, awesome, okay. And then uh, let me see, there were a couple more questions. Um, I find, uh... Oh yeah, someone, uh, Dom Dorn asked about, will we need something like transitive? Uh, like the, where does the, uh, the, or does that not make any sense in this context? Um, so it, 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 transitivity, I wouldn't think of as a, um, one of these abstractions itself, but it's a property for the laws of some of these. So for example, if I do, let's see, let's go here. So equal is a abstraction that says, I know how to compare two values for equality. And there are a bunch of laws that that should satisfy, including things like transitivity. 
so one of the things that's really important to us in, in Zia Prelude is each of these abstractions should have a set of laws associated with it. And that's kind of what distinguishes um, a abstraction like this that should be a type class versus something that uh, should be more of like a service in the Zio environment. So if we think about like something like uh, the console service, that makes sense as a service versus as being a abstraction because it doesn't have laws that it satisfies in the same way. It's not fundamental in the same way. Um, so that's why we use the environment for it and we can provide different implementations of it versus like there's really kind of, I mean, maybe for efficiency, we can try to compute something slightly differently, but there's like only one meaningful way to like define quality over integers. Feel free, if I missed any questions, feel free to re, re, re write them or just ping me. Um, but I think we got through the queue again. Okay, cool. Um, so I think we, we, we managed to hit on some good stuff there about like the kind of names and why we structured them the way we did. I think maybe the last thing I'll, I'll have for us to think about is um, I think sometimes you can get the most value out of these abstractions, either just by using them tactically like we did sometimes here or by just using them as inspiration. So uh, going back to what I was talking about earlier, like we never want to force like using these abstractions on people. Um, but I think like, the, I, I definitely would love for people to learn more about this. I mean, I love spending time like talking about it, but I think the best way people learn is when it's like a natural process of discovery. And so for example, if you're working with Zio, you might notice that like Zio has this zip with operator. Let's even, let's even get simple. It's not assigned to zip with, let's just do zip. You need to add a plus before the E. Oh, thank you. And you might have also noticed there's something like Z stream. And so you might look at these and again, you can work with them and you, you can spend the rest of your life working with them and kind of not use any, not use Zio Prelude or at least not use any abstractions from Zio Prelude. But if you had an afternoon where you were like thinking about it and you were being contemplative, you might notice that there's a good amount of similarity between these two things that kind of other than me like covering up the Zio and replacing it with ZStream, these look basically the same. And even like they kind of, I mean, they do something a little bit different of like this one just kind of combines the two values from these two individual effects versus this kind of combines each of the values that gets emitted by the stream. But there's also like, if you step back a little bit from that, there's like something in common of these of like, essentially I've got two things and I'm like smushing them together and I'm getting a third thing. And I've taken this like, a and B and I've like put them together to be the A and the B here. And if you, if you ever are like thinking about those things, I think that's a really good time. Again, if you're like feeling like it to go to Zio Prelude or you know, maybe you know, ask someone if you want to and kind of say like, what's the abstraction for that? And so like in this case, this would be the example. So we, we talked about category one, we've used that a bunch here. We saw a little bit of category two when we did like the equal. This would be an example of that category three. And it's the type's a little bit more complicated than this because we have the R and the E, but the R and the E didn't really change here. We just kind of unified the types of the two of them. So what both of these really are is we had this parameterized type and we combined it together. In this case, this was a FA and an FB, and we got an FAB. And so this is an example of an abstraction that in Zio Prelude we call associative both. Um, in, the, uh, in the traditional encoding, you could think of this as applicative, though it kind of 
applicative actually mixes in two things, right? It mixes in kind of the combining versus the like injecting. So this would kind of be apply, but apply really fits more with Haskell than with Scala just because of the way that like function application uh, works. But so this essentially says like, if I've got these two parameterized types, I can combine them and I can do it in a way that combines the values from each of them. And so you, you can look at that and I mean, if you want to, you can definitely like use that. But I think a lot of times the more valuable thing that you can do is you can start to recognize a pattern that you can apply in whatever you're doing. So what you could ask yourself, like whenever I have a data type, is there a way that I can support an operator like this? So like in um, Zio Flow, I think they have something like this uh, remote trait. And so this describes some uh, essential description of how to produce a value of type A that can be serialized and transmitted and could be produced on some remote node in a distributed system. And so without knowing anything about this type yet, one of the things that like I might be thinking about is, is there a way to do this? Is there some operator that is going to take another remote and give me a remote that produces both of those values. And I could think about like, well, what does that mean? I guess in this case, that would mean I have to have, I, with these are really just descriptions, then I guess that makes a lot of sense that I have a description of how to produce an A at a remote node. I have a description of how to produce a B at a remote node. I can take those two descriptions and I could send them both to a remote node and that remote node could produce both the A's and the B's. And okay, that seems like it makes sense. I mean, again, like I'm kind of just ideating here. Um, but so that might be like a good inspiration if we were working on this data type for us to say, is that an operator we can implement? It seems like it would be a good one to have. Uh, if not, why not? And like, does that indicate something about the way we're modeling our problem? And if, if we kind of keep going down this road and we get like more familiar with some of these concepts, even if we don't use them, it can give us some really good inspiration for how to create our data types in a way that's very composable where like coworkers or people who are reviewing our PRs are gonna say like, wow, you create a nice API for that. Like good, good architecture, good design. And the thing about this is like so far here, like you know, in my head, like I may have known about this stuff and like been thinking about it and it gave me some good inspiration, but there's no, you know, there may be no dependency on Zio, Zio Prelude here. There may be no type class here. There may be none of that. And you know, a lot of times that may be something that is actually a selling point for other people in our organization of like, you know, I don't have to learn all this new stuff. I just like, this is a nice API. This works well. This lets me do the kind of things I would want to do with this data type. Um, and I think sometimes there can be like a feeling of like, ah, uh, like I'm, I'm supposed to do all this stuff or like if I'm not taking advantage of all these type classes, I'm like not being a good functional programmer or whatever. And I, I think you absolutely like shouldn't have that attitude that I mean, if, if you're part of an organization that wants to kind of work at this level of abstraction, that that's fine, that's great. And you know, we 100% want to support that. And we've got lots of stuff for you in Zio Prelude. But I think a lot of people, organizations, it, it may not make sense now, or maybe for them, it may not make sense ever. And I think sometimes the way you can get the most value out of it is more by like taking inspiration for these and like having this as your own mental model and then translating into very concrete things like this. Um, so yeah, that would, I guess that is my heresy. So get ready to pass it out. <laughs> uh, yeah. That, and this, I mean, from my own experience, I came from, uh, you know, FP, uh, Haskell was kind of my introduction to a lot of these concepts. And, you know, I thought I was a, a type wizard and, and all, um, but really uh, only once I started sort of via Zio and, and, and joining up with you and John and practicing this stuff for the last year, did I realize like I actually didn't really know what I thought I knew. I knew the words, I knew the terms, but I couldn't design something functionally, I would kind of like, you know, grab around in the, in the dark for these type classes. But really, at the end of the day, it's it's actually kind of 
it's it's so much better to think about it in these terms. Maybe it's more boring. Oh, zip and flat map. People make fun of you know poke fun of saying oh you, you're going to rename Monad flat mappable, but um, and maybe maybe that's a little extreme. But uh, like it becomes kind of mechanical and kind of rote and kind of like less okay, less celestial, uh, and it's just like. I just want to combine some stuff. I mean, that's really what composition is about. That's what all these abstractions are name, uh, names are about. It's about breaking stuff apart and combining. Com composition is breaking large problems into small ones in, in a, such a way that you can then piece back those sub solutions into the grander solution, which is really uh, easy and convenient. And, and you know, we, our, our little monkey brains can only hold so much information in a, in a, and so we need to break them apart. And by just thinking in terms of these kind of simple like Lego models, it actually becomes a lot simpler. Generally, they look like this, you know, zipping. Um, sometimes there's the there's that associative either, right, when you break it out into this or that. So there's this and and or. And really, that's so much easier to think about than like having this vast array of terminology in your head that's just going to sort of mystify. You might even think you understand it, but you won't be able to actually implement anything from scratch. You, do, you, you know, as Adam said, just sort of don't import any libraries, just make, you don't, you don't really need only a few of these to be useful. Um, where they do become useful, I think you hit on just the right ones. Um, generally, whenever I needed to import uh, a type class library was, you know, semi-groups that nested semi-group instance combining maps with sets inside of them, right? Or validation, like that's like the 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of the time you're doing the, the semi-group here associative or you're doing uh, validated really. But other than that, implement them yourself. And uh, just also, as Adam said, keep an eye out for worm is worm is calling, uh, or or uh, just keep an eye for these patterns. And they're pretty silly. Don't you don't even need to think about the words. Just look at how like oh the similarities between Zio and ZStream and like JSON codecs and using these functional libraries, you'll see that basically you always have zip, you always have or else, you always have flat map. Sometimes they don't always work. You need to do something like called xmap or something. Uh, just be, be mindful and then try to implement them yourself. It's actually the implementations are pretty easy generally if you're not super abstract, but just to hop also on your soapbox with you. Totally agree. <laughs> yeah, and, and another thing, uh, I mean, one of these sessions, maybe we can do like a session on variants, but I think variants also really fits into this where as you do this more, you'll learn there are some different typical operators for covariant versus contravariant types. So like, you'll notice all three of these had the plus A and plus A things have a set of operators they typically have. They typically have map, they typically have zip, often they'll have flat map. Uh, there are other things that will have a minus A here that'll be like a sync. And those have, themselves have a set of kind of typical operators that they'll typically have a contra map. They'll typically have what we would call an either with, sometimes a both with. Um, and those also like fit together and so uh, as you like think about like variants that like also like give you a clue of like almost like if you just tell me like it's a contravariant type like I've already got a mental model of like a set of operators that like I'd at least be asking myself like what would it mean for this type and could it be implemented for this type. And, and the, the implementation, correct me if I'm wrong, is generally once at that point pretty mechanical and I'm kind of not exciting and so you don't necessarily feel like you're you know you're just doing some work and at the end of the day you get a really nice API. And you didn't actually need to, uh, you know, lock yourself away in a, in a high tower for a long time to think about it. It just kind of falls out of, of it. That might be an interesting exercise, maybe for next time, is to just like, because uh, uh, I like the, the terms you use. Like, the, I I don't think there's a lot of uh, writing out, out there, <laughs> especially not in the Haskell world. And it's kind of what I wanted for a long time, which is just what you just said, like. How do people think about this when they're writing it? Oh, I noticed this thing about it. And now I know I have probably have these eight or 10 methods that will be useful to me. Let me see if I can get, you know, get them. Maybe we should try to do that or, or also look at some sort of do this sort of a, a analysis of, of different data types, like, you know, JSON libraries, parsers, Zio, et cetera, and see what are the, what are the commonalities? What are the sort of the groupings here? I think thinking about these abstract things concretely, uh, while for some reason there's sometimes mocked or whatever is just like a good way to learn it. And then you'll have an understanding concretely of the abstractions that you can then, you know, it'll actually be useful to abstract and you'll get the purpose of it. Instead of, if you just start an abstract world, you have nothing to hold on to. You don't really understand the abstractions. I think I was there for a long time. I thought I, thought I half understood them, but uh, yeah, doing them concretely is the best way to really know them. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that could be really interesting. And I mean, maybe it could be a good way to also 
explore a little bit more of some of the individual um, abstractions here, because I think we probably like, hopefully this was helpful for people in kind of giving um, my some of the quick wins, but I, I have a feeling some people may be like, okay, well, that's great, but we didn't really get into the like associative either and like what that is and all that. And we can, we can hit that a little bit. And I think one of the other interesting things about that is it really, um, when you do that, the complexity you think about actually ends up being the complexity associated with your individual data type. So like, um, let's see, let's go to like equal here. So uh, equals one of those contravariant types that has this both with operator. And so both with basically says, if I have a way of saying whether A's are equal and I have a way of saying whether B's are equal, what would it mean to, let's, let's just do that with both to slightly simpler what would it mean to have a way of saying that pairs of A's and B's are equal? And when you think about it concretely there, it's like, okay, it's, it's actually like pretty obvious once you think about it of, it means the A's are equal and it means the B's are equal. Um, but that's not like necessarily always true of if we go to something like, so this has a similar operator, but it's got a little bit more of a complicated meaning because now we're saying if I've got a way of ordering by one thing and I've got a way of ordering by another thing, how do I get a way of ordering by both things? And this time it kind of means ordering by one and then the other. So it's like if I'm ordering by first name and last name, I order by first name. And then if you happen to have the same first name, then I order by last name. So there ends up being sometimes some complexity, but it actually generally ends up being the complexity that's like specific to your domain, which is, is often like a good thought provoking thing to think about like, do I really understand my domain? And like, what are its properties? And are there different ways maybe I should be encoding it that would allow it to have more properties or different properties? I think the example of the, those two associative Im implementations, right? <laughs> for, for integers, for addition, it was, very silly, you just delegate it to the plus operator. Whereas for map associative, it was, you know, I'd say an order of magnitude more complicated. Um, it also required an, an inductive nested instance and, and you needed to think about how maps work and all these uh, immutable maps too, so. Yeah, uh, and one of the things that Zia Prelo gives you is it gives you a set of laws that you can test for each of these things. Um, so we, we saw one, but let me just like really quickly show like the, associative one. So it's just got this law for associativity and you can actually run this yourself. So that can be like another useful thing of like, even if you're playing around with something, I mean, maybe it's not gonna end up in your like production code, but you may wanna either use this law or maybe just kind of write your own test that does a similar thing, but it can be useful to check yourself sometimes. Cause sometimes you like, you know, like it kind of seems like the types fit together and like this thing satisfies the law, but sometimes there's some reason that it, it doesn't quite satisfy the law. And then you can kind of think about like, okay, is, it, is that okay? Or do I need to do something different? Or how do I deal with that? But like, it's also sometimes good to be able to like check yourself. Also it can be useful and fun to break the law sometimes. <laughs> if, uh, if, it's, if it's use, if you gain a lot from it uh, and you can get away with it. Um, so uh, just a random thought, uh, I'm, I'm quoting uh, more of a comment than a question. Uh, someone educated in maths, uh, math, math plural, so uh, I'm guessing from Europe, or not, or not in America, I don't know where math is pluralized, but I think most of the world, um, I like it. Um, oh, sorry, <laughs> someone educated in maths will recognize an addable with identity and inverse type plus as a mathematical concept of a group, the other way around telling everyone that a monoid means you can add it, but it doesn't, need to have an inverse or a zero element is is much harder. And I I think I think that's right. Like what you said before, right? If people who know semi-group already know semi-group, you don't need to, they don't need that as a teaching term. They can be frustrated that okay, now they have to learn associative, but they'll get it. Um, whereas at least associative has a hint um, for other yeah. people. Optimize for the people who are going to have the most trouble with this because yeah sometimes we get them like man why did you call it for each instead of traverse like anyone coming from haskell is gonna know what traverse is they're not gonna know what for each is and if you're coming from haskell like you've already like got like 90 percent of this i mean then all you have to learn is like okay it's 
for each instead of traverse and like you've like already like won the game versus like the other person you know maybe you're coming from java maybe you don't know about this stuff like there's a lot more you need to learn and like let's make it as easy as we can there yeah and i mean i i love this stuff i think it's super fascinating i like the the technical stuff and hey if you're writing math papers use semi-group like you're speaking to an audience of people who know it's abstractions you can use the most dense abstraction for people who already know it right if you know if you're talking to somebody else who has the same knowledge don't you don't need to with together all of the the things you can call it by you know make a new acronym for it call it something short but um the point is like it's it's the stuff is actually i think can be a lot easier than it has a reputation for but you generally i think historically it's been taught from people coming from academia and and with phds and have a certain shared lingo and 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 way of speaking and understanding and shared concepts that they can leverage and that just becomes like a totally alienating uh, obstruction for everyone else like it was so hard to learn this stuff and just as as it's after banging my head against it for years i'm i'm realizing it did not have to be nearly this hard and i think the way to inspire new people and to get more people you know I want more people to, to nerd out about this stuff with. And the way to do that is going to be to get more people into it. And I think to do that is to like, yeah, let them use tools like Zio, like really cool JSON libraries, like things that just make their jobs and lives easier. And then slowly let them by themselves realize like, you know, as natural, a natural thing for people to do is like, this is really useful. What's the secret sauce here? And they're gonna, they're gonna hopefully ask and hopefully there'll be material, hopefully like this. Um, that will help them sort of, yeah, work up until they can eventually, you know, talk with the PhD candidates and, and understand it. But like, it would be cool to have sort of a natural progression of, as you said, Adam, like discovery. I think it's a natural human thing. It's just that there's a huge, a huge cliff. Um, and most of that cliff is just terminology, I think, and, and, and sort of ways of approaching it. And, and yeah, which works from a certain angle, but not from, I think the angle that most developers come from or at least a lot of developers who probably would be interested in this stuff and I want to I want to be able to talk about this stuff with so cool questions we should hit on before we wrap up here let's see um oh yes so um so this is probably a good last couple of questions um Don Dorn asked I love saying your name Don Dorn uh <laughs> um so what's the best way to get started with Prelude uh, the microsite isn't ready I skipped through the slides uh of John um, and I still don't have a clue. So yeah, besides this video, which hopefully gives you a couple of tools to get started with it. Yeah, how, any, any thoughts there? I mean, probably we need to can work on that some more, but uh, what are well, your thoughts? I mean, I think, I think there's definitely stuff we can do around documentation and stuff, but I, I would say pick a couple of concrete things that you think can actually be helpful to you. Um, I think the Scala doc is actually in a lot of cases pretty good. I mean, the, the, the website definitely needs work and then probably there's a lot we could do just taking the Scala doc and putting it on the website, but like Scala doc is overall pretty good. So I would say like, maybe if you, you've, you've taken the time to like watch this video. So I think you've already got a decent starting point. Like think about which of these things would be useful in your day-to-day -day work. If it's validation or if it's the new types, um, go to the page for that. I think like if we go to the, um, so like here, if you go to this, file for the new type module, there's, there's pretty detailed documentation here of what this is, of a bunch of different examples of using it with subtypes, with new types, with abstractions. So I, I would, and I think if you go to a bunch of these, like validation, again, like I think you've got a lot of content here. So I would pick a couple of these that you think could be useful for you in your day-to-day -day work and like start with them and try to try to use them to solve the actual problem you're encountering. And hopefully, especially with kind of this content, like you, you feel like you can make a decent start at doing one of these things. And then if you, if you find that helpful and have success with that, then build from there. And if you have questions, uh, definitely on the Discord anytime. And we'll definitely also be working on building out the documentation we've been probably focused on Zio right now. And hopefully people have seen that's gotten better, but that's definitely gonna be coming over time to other libraries in the ecosystem. And I think what you went over today is, is really, as I mentioned, the 80-20 rule before, like getting started with, yeah, the new types validation and that associative uh, operator. By the way, I don't know if you mentioned when you import 
zero.prelude.underscore, you get operators, right? There are a bunch of implicit methods. You don't have to actually import any separate syntax thing. I think you used. Yeah, you, you should get basically everything with this, with the exception of if you want like the um, like the sum dot wrap that comes in this new type in this new types module. Mm -hmm. um, and what was the the associative operator? Is it that? Oh, it looks that. Uh, it's just the arrow yeah. arrow. That will just exist now on these on these that types. That will just exist on anything. Yeah. So like with this in scope, I mean, I can do. Uh, what's a good example? When I do like this one, two, three. Mm -hmm. So this is just in, in the case of lists, the associative operation is just concatenating them. So this will just give us one list, one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah. <laughs> so yes, it's check out the code browse through it and read the Scala doc. Exactly. Um, uh, for now. And obviously, hopefully this, this was helpful. Um, but we could also probably have maybe more of a, uh, a guide uh, on, on the page, just sort of yeah, give you a lay of the land. But as, as Adam also said, it's like it's pretty general, right? It's called Prelude. It's not AWS or anything. So it can do a lot. Um, uh, and let me see. Um, OK, I think last question. Um, will will the SE software engineering practical things of Zio Prelude refine new types of types be included in Zionomicon? Also, is Zionomicon going to be geared towards Zio 2.0 with uh, the macro stuff, um, the layer stuff, uh, tracing metrics, etc.? So Zionomicon is definitely going to be updated for Zio 2.0. Uh, I would say it is not going to include Zio Prelude coverage. Not. Obviously, I, I love Zero Prelude. I like wrote a lot of it, um, but just like the book is already very long and has a lot to cover, and like still has significant more content to be created for like different like things. I think a little more closely tied to Zio itself, or kind of how you do practical things with Zio. Uh, if anything, I think maybe at some point, I'm not sure what like the name for it would be, um, but I could see there being like either like a separate book about Zeo Prelude or maybe kind of Zeonomicon at some point evolves to be a little more of like a online like premium content thing where like it can be like a little more of a living thing and like we can add to it with content on like other things that like isn't so limited by just like a book can only be of like a certain size and be you know, reasonable at all. Um, but eventually would like to have you know, more high quality content for all of this stuff. I was thinking of a meetup clone, but maybe something like a you know a, a community editable <laughs> wiki Gitbook situation might be the good candidate for a, a Zio app uh, or a full stack application. Um, so if we could embed some of your cool graphics, yeah, some syntax highlighting, some uh, that would be that would be a juicy project. Probably pretty difficult, but I've always wanted something like that. Um, anyway, it'll be we'll learn something even if we fail. Uh, so, okay, and oh yeah, um, Von Shav also uh, posted that Jorge has uh, already done three talks in Prelude, so those are probably great to watch. And I think he goes over validated and, and, and some other stuff that sounded like the, the new types of- And some of his talks are like very good, like along the same lines of like, here are 10 practical problems you can solve with Zeo Prelude. So yeah, I think that's, that, that's another really good resource. Um, and then, yeah, either after this or just as you're thinking about things, if um, I was like, it's, it's a whole library, it has a lot of things in here. I, I tried to hit on the high points and, and maybe we'll come back to this again, kind of diving into how to think about operators. But um, if there are like specific things that you're like, ah, oh, like I really wish we had done that, like please, uh, you know, comment now or comment later in the Discord or one of us. And we can definitely try to either hit on those individually or kind of incorporate those into a broader topic at some point. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Adam. That was that was awesome. And thanks everyone. Um, as yeah. usual, keep if you have questions that hit you, you know, wake you up in the middle of the night or whatever, uh, after your beers wear off, uh, please post them in the meetup channel. And we're gonna be doing this again next Thursday. So another sort of time shift to accommodate the arrival of of John. Uh, John Dicos is going to join us, and we're probably going to go through Zio schema. Um, and the idea is actually going to sort of be going over what that project is and then talk about um, some ways that people can contribute if you'd like to. And I think Adam and I might take, a, take an issue sort of with the guide of yeah. oh, people who are interested in, in doing open source stuff, uh, uh, removing the activation costs there and, and showing that it can be uh, 
pretty pretty easy and, and, and boring and fun all at the same time. Uh, so thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Bye, all.